All right, Michael, uh, thank you for presenting. Do you want to introduce yourself and get started? Go ahead. All right, thank you. I'm uh, Michael Spore, and tonight I'm going to present on various car card and Weibo formats, going from very basic ones to more advanced ones and how to properly fill them out. Th this presentation is more on just the various types of like formats people have used over the years, from like the basic ones to like more advanced ones, and some, some haven't been used in quite some time. Right. This slide is just uh, some of the key um, points. Yeah, we need to get your, oh, there we go. Never mind, go ahead. Right. Yes, that's the most important part if you're doing car cards and way bills is the obvious, this, your operators have to be able to read and understand them. If they cannot read or comprehend your car cards or waybills, then either to fix them or to teach your operators how to understand them. And especially when you have new guests to your layout or you know, like visit groups, you know, they have to be able to understand that the system you're using, especially for you know, rookie operators. And it, it might, you might have to give them a class on this like no matter who the operator is, if you give you know, a 20 minute class, I, I'll bet oh, all the operators could understand your system after that. But some people have you know, less knowledge than others on car cards and way bills. So just make sure you know, all your operators don't actually know how your system works. And just don't be afraid to you know, give a class to you know, newer people. That's another point is you know, it's your layout. You can use whatever system you want. However, they said before, the key is that your operators have to you know, actually understand the format you are using. Then another key point is, if you have the ability to use a computer to do this or a typewriter, I would highly recommend you do that versus handwriting. I've been to some layouts where they hand wrote you know, all the car cards and waybills and their handwriting is so bad, I had an extremely hard time comprehending what was on the car cards and waybills. Especially if you operate with a fast clock or things like that, you don't want to have people you know, wasting time trying to comprehend you know, what, what your handwriting is. And the last point, I'll discuss this towards the later slides, but some layouts do not use car cards. All the information are on their waybills. And this is more of a prototype practice also. I said this will be on some of the, the later slides. Okay. Before I go in that, though, let's go over some various references, which can help you, you know, better fill out your car cards and waybills. Well, let's go left or right. And these are just some of the references. Obviously, there are you know, dozens upon dozens of more which you can use. Okay, starting on the left, just the Rand McNally Railroad Atlas. You know, they produced these for various years. The one I took a picture of here is from 1965. I bought this on eBay for, I think, $15. Buy various ones of these from you know, the 40s through, I think they stopped producing these in the 1980s. All right, as having a map is something key because if you have the map, you can figure out the routes the cars might take. And you can also figure out you know, interchanges with other railroads uh, on, on the routes. The next is uh, equipment registers. Yeah, most people are probably familiar with these, but. You know, do you have FIFA equip registers? You can figure out you know, virtually all information on freight cars by railroads and private railroads and places like that. And another thing for more modern modelers is the, the official uh, intermodal equipment register. It's basically the same guide except you know, for intermodal equipment. So you could go to like SP and see you know, all the trailers and containers that SP has by like, you no know, 48 feet, 45 feet. And then the end of each railroad, they also give all the intermodal facilities you know, for each railroad. So if you model, you no know, you know, present day for intermodal equipment, that could be very helpful. And the next one is, you know, industry circulars or industry guides. This one is a CB&Q one from 1966. This, if you search by this inside the book, you can search, it's by state, and then it's by city within state. So if you zoom into a page, you can look at you know, all, this also includes, the CBQ ones also includes all Fort Worth and Denver and CNS ones. 
So you could go to the page for you know, Dallas, Texas and see all industries that they served in Dallas, Texas. And if industries served by multiple railroads, it also lists the other roads that served as industries. And you, you can find these on you know, eBay or places that have reproduced these. Now, Rails Unlimited is one company that's reproduced a bunch of these. So you can find these for various years for you know, whatever you model. On the right, or some railroads have you no know, spins books or clicks books. The, the one on the right is a, a Southern Pacific one from 1983. This book is from the Houston, Houston, Texas area. It has, if you just open up to a random page, you can see they have a, you know, a track chart for the switching area and they have numbers and the right side, the number corresponds to the specific industry that's on, on that track chart. So I said SP, Santa Fe and other roads have produced books like these. You know, it's very helpful because it'll give you, you know, all the industries and where they are on the actual track charts for the railroads. And you can very easily find these on eBay or in train shows. And next is some other uh, reference guides. The left, some railroads have produced uh, industrial properties books. The one I have on here is a CB and Q one from the 1960s. And these books have you know, aerial photographs of like yards and industrial areas. Then they'll have you know, sometimes they draw the lines of where the, the like railroads are, and they'll name some of the industries. Now, some of these industrial guides are current industries and also future industries. Some of them they'll give to like real estate like agents to try to you know, sell the companies to build you know, properties on their areas. So if you can, I don't know how many roads have actually produced these, but I know some have. It's very helpful because you get this idea you know, aerial photography of uh, various road areas, and then they'll write on there you know, what each industry is in the areas. The next are official railway guides. Many of these are produced, they originally were produced though in paper and now they're produced in like PDF or CD format. Say that the railroad guides are by specific commodity type. So when I have here, it's a what, 2002 and it lists all port and intermodal and then warehouses. But I also have some of these for grain and lumber. So they, I think in the mid 2000s, they stopped producing these on paper. And now they're only available by PDF or CD. The one on the right is also one specific for intermodal. This is from 1994. This railway guide that lists all intermodal facilities by railroad and also by like private ones. And also they list ports. Then they also list like companies who service those areas and other information. So if you, you want to, for specific you know, commodity types, you just find the various official railway guide for, for that commodity type. These can be easily found on eBay or other or train shows, other areas. And the next is you know, one of the best ones, the, the OPSIG industry database. If, if I remember right, you have to be a member to use this. Is that correct? Uh, no, that's actually available to uh, everybody. Okay. Um, yeah. So even if you're logged out, um, the everything under the resources and links section is freely available. Okay, that's good. Say so this is one of the best places to find you know industries on railroads in various cities. Then the next is on the right side. This is more on the more I'd say more on the advanced side for waybills. This is the railway accounting rules. This is a pretty you know, dry and boring book. However, towards the back, they actually list, they have no, no basic you know, forms for waybills. So if you want to see what the actual waybill forms for were, you can do from this book. This is, a, this is a picture of one I bought on eBay for probably like $20. But if you want to get more prototype-based waybills, this book is good because it has the actual you know, the actual formats, then the rules for those waybills. The next, if you model the you know, present day or more recent times, one of the best references is using simply like Google Maps. Just go to you know, wherever you model, then see what industries are there. And obviously you can click on this industries to learn more. 
the screenshot I have is here is what I modeled here, which is BN's North Houston industrial area. On the right, there's just a small, a small industrial yard. Then they go from there, they go down south, then they go left to switch all these industries there. The big industry in the center there used to be Mrs. Baird's, there's a bakery. Now it's, now it's recently bought by you know, Bimbo Snacks. But say if you model more recent times using you know, Google Maps of the huge health, even if you want to go back, you can use you know, historic aerials. So you can go back, you know, basically however far you want. But obviously in historic aerials, they don't you know, list the industry names. So you'd have to figure out the industry names else, elsewise. Right, and this is this is definitely the best reference I've ever seen for car cars and waybills. It's Tony Thompson's No Waybill blog series. He's done over a hundred posts so far on this. And the one I saved here is his, with the, his 100th Waybill post, and it's from November of this year. And the, the 100th one is best because he has a list basically summarizing all the previous 99 posts and then what topic they were. So instead of having to read through all 100, you can just go to oh, the 100th one and then click on the ones you find most interesting. So if you know, Going to do the more advanced, more prototype based car cars and waybills. Tony Thompson's blog series is the without a doubt the best that I've ever seen. Okay, I'll start out with some of the, the older car card formats. This is the old line graphics one. This is more common, I would say, like 20 or so years ago. The left side is just the, the blank one and the right side is filled out. So this is one of the, the older types used. And this is also, I say one of the more basic ones. However, it does have all the information you actually you know, need on there. So you have the road name, the car number, and then the type for the AR designation. And also has an empty car return to block if you, if you want to use that. And just, can you go back one, just for everybody's benefit, if you haven't seen these, the idea is that you fold up on that line and it makes like a little pocket. You tape, you tape on either side to make these. And then the way bill actually goes into the pocket. Yeah, that's a good point. And also in these, I, I just scanned them in and just used the, the computer to add them. These are obviously printed on a card stock. So you'd have to use what typewriter or you know, handwrite, handwrite them on there, unless you digitize them. Next, this is the another older one used, the, the Alan McClellan's format. I think he's the one who originally came up with this. And these are these are much larger. They're three inch by five inch, and these come on card stock. This is also a more a basic one. You just have the type of car, the reporting marks, the car number, the AAR designation. And if you want, you can have the, the type of commodity at the bottom. I just did this for a, San, for a SP reefer. And some of them on the right also have the return empty block on the right. So these are, I've, I haven't seen too many people use these in the last like 20-ish years, but these are fairly effective and good ones. This one downside that people said of these is just the size, that they're three inch by five inch. These are significantly larger than you know, the MicroMark or Old Line Graphics ones. Now, the, these ones, I have digitized them. And I just print them off on cardstock. So instead of spending time with a typewriter handwriting these, I just put these in Microsoft PowerPoint and then just print them off on cardstock. That makes it significantly easier. Right. These are the micro mark ones. These are similar to the old line graphic ones, except this more, I say more advanced. These are also ones that are in card stock and you fold up to make a pocket. These are probably some of the more common ones that you find in layouts. These are the ones that I use myself. Now I'll just briefly go over like how the things go in there. Starting in the top right, the AR designation. The 
The big key for this is making sure you use the correct AAR designation. I've been through quite a few layouts where people use the wrong AR designation that can cause confusion. This one example I put here is BX is AR designation for express box car, not box car. XM is used on most box cars. You saw the XP or XL, some other ones. This, I say before, if your operators don't know the AR designations, it would be good to like teach them that or just give them a printout of what they are. Now, some people point out to me that BX, Santa Fe uses BX as a name for most box cars. However, to my knowledge, the AR designation for box car is still XM. So if you're putting BX and you have a Santa Fe bother, just make sure you like inform your operators that you're using BX for box car, because people will be confused and start looking for express box cars. Another one that I've seen is people will put CH for covered hopper instead of LO. I saw that people were confused because they thought CH meant wood chip cars. So people were looking around to lay out for wood chip cars, but they're actually supposed to be looking for covered hoppers. Just the big key is just make sure you use the correct AR designations and people know what they actually are. If the next is the kind, the kind block, many, many people will put you know, covered hopper again there. For the kind block, you're supposed to put the specific kind of covered hopper. So here I put ACF 4650, or you could be ACF 2970 or whatever. That this just makes it easier to find the specific type of car you have. Then below is the obvious, the, the railroad, and then the number of the car. And for description, this is more just what you want to do. I usually leave this blank, but you can put the color of a car if you want, or you can put a specific the commodity of the car or specific service the car is in. That's really up to you. Then for the return empty, that's whether you want to use it or not. But if you have a type of car that generally goes to a specific industry or a specific yard, that might be helpful. If you model more present day times for sit yards, you have a lot of plastic pellet cars or tank cars that would go back to a, a sit yard, even maybe a specific sit yard. So that could be something you do there. Say now I'm gonna go to waybills. This is the most basic waybill format there is. For some layouts, I mean, this is all you really need. I mean, all you need is for the waybills where the car is going, where it's coming from. I mean, in the end, you might not need to do anything more than simply doing this. And then for you can just make it fit the size for whatever you know, car card car card you're using. This is the old line graphics ones. These are some older ones that I don't I haven't I've seen a layout in probably 20 years that uses these that you can still find these, I think sold on eBay or someplace, or maybe people have like stockpiles of these at home. These are the four cycle waybills. But the left side is the blank empty one. The right side has filled out the top part. In the top left, you have the car, the car type. So I just put XM for box car. And to the right, you have the routing. Let's put SP, so this is routed on the SP. And below that, you have more specific routing. However, due to the size of these, and the fact that they're a four cycle waybill, there's very little room to do more advanced routing. So for this, I just put it goes on SP from Sacramento to San Francisco via Stockton, California. As I'd even simplify San Francisco down to SF because there simply just wasn't room to do that. Then below that, you can slightly do more. So this is going to Zorin Industries in San Francisco. That's going from Acme Fertilizer in Sacramento, California. And the contents is fertilizer. So this is one I digitized, but this is also ones that come in card stock. So you would have to either use a typewriter or handwrite this. So there's these are small, so you can only put so much information on these. These are the micro mark four cycle waybills. These are a as a slightly more advanced than the previous ones. But also, however, though, these are four cycle, 
and the size is small, so there's still very little room to put more information. However, if you can put you know, at least the basic information, so it's going from you know, Zorn Industries in San Francisco, then the routing is SP Sacramento to San Francisco. So but you, can only, you can only put so much in the routing box. You just have to put the basics. It's going to SP Sacramento to San Francisco. And it's going uh, via Stockton, California. And it's the, the shipper is Acme Fertilizer in Sacramento and it's shipping, you know, the commodity is fertilizer. I mean, you, you might not need more than this, but if you want to do like more advanced, you'll have to use a different way bill format. If some people like the four cycle way bills because you can just easily flip it and do the next one and you can do it four times. I like more the two cycle or the one cycle ones because you can put significantly more information on them. But in the end, it's entirely up to you which, you know, which information you put on there and which you know, formats you use. These are the, the Alan McClung way bill ones. These are two cycle. You just flip it and then it's on the other side. So these are also in cardstock and these are significantly larger. So this does allow you to put you know, much larger routing information. Like this one is a simple routing. However, I've, I've seen some of these, we have like three or four different railroads and the routing box is you know, pretty extensive. But one advantage of these is the size is large. So the size being large allows you to you know, put more information on there. And these are by, the car classification. So this one is for a box car. So you could just have a giant box of these for you no know, box cars. If you just move them in a box car somewhere else, you just put in a new label from your you know, pile. And at the very end, I have ways of storing storing these. Let's say this one I have digitized into PowerPoint. So I'll just print. I think I can put four of these on a PowerPoint slide and just print it out. Digitizing this is significantly easier than having used a typewriter or, hand, or handwriting all of these. These are a different type of one for a different type of layout. These are Bernie Kempinski's, which he uses for his uh, Civil War layout. The left side is just the blank one. Then the middle is that in the, the industry, the holder he has on his layouts. And the right side are the ones on the, the newer, the newer style he has, which are smaller, which he fits inside the, the plastic sleeves there. But these, these are, you can handwrite, but they're very, no, they're very easy to use and very effective. I just included this because it shows, even if you model the 1800s, you can still have effective car cards and waybills. And also have some of these digitized, so you can print it also, versus if you want to handwrite it. But I also like this slide because this shows you that some people they'll you know, put these in sleeves, or some people put them in like big holders by industries. Just however you want to do that, it's up to you, and that's more just up to how you know, large these are. Say Bernie for these, he made them smaller more recently, so he could put them in these sleeves. Say the the picture on the right I took I think two weeks ago at his layout. It just shows Ditto, the car type U.S. Then, then the number 1142, then type boxcar, then below that return MT2, the Aquia Landing Wharf 2. Then the notes would be the, was the quartermaster, and the notes will just have various other notes. These are the, some of the, some of the newer types, digital ones. These are the, Ted Pamperin has them some more, the it's commonly used like digital waybills. I used his format for these and I slightly modified them. I'll start off in the top right. The top right is though, the railroad that the car originates on or the car handling the car. This isn't the reporting marks of the actual car itself. On a prototype on the top, it would be the car, the railroad that handles the car. I've had seen some, some layouts effectively they'll put the railroad in the top for the car that's handling the car on the layout. If you have a layout that has you know, four or five or six different railroads, having that on the top can be very helpful. 
Except that there could be a lot of confusion as you know, which railroad is handling which car. So just putting it at the top could be helpful. Say this one is handled by the Milwaukee. Then the right there, the AR designation, Jitaga 4. This, that below, block below there, that's the, the shipper. The bottom is the car commodity. And up there, yeah, some, but you can use that if you want. Say it's in Milwaukee, the 29041. And that's a, some people delete those from there because they don't want the, the label tied to a specific car. So you just want, once a generic service is just delete that block. However, if you want labels assigned to specific cars, just leave that in there. The block below that is the direction the car will travel. So this car travels south. This is the, the destination of the car. This is going to the Hunter Duncan Lumber Company in Oglesby, Illinois. Then below there is instructions. This should just show special instructions for the cars, or it could show it's more advanced routing information, or if it shows oh, a specific train is picking it up. The instructions for this one is that Milwaukee local power set off the car and the Rochelle house track. Then train 367 will pick it up later in the operating session. One thing for this one, people, a lot of people know is that the Milwaukee also shared Rochelle, Illinois. They had an engine based out of there and they had trackage rights over the Q and then Burlington through Rochelle. There's a lot of ministries in Rochelle are also served by the Milwaukee. And the Milwaukee Historical Society did an article on this line. So all the way bill information I use for these Milwaukee ones is directly from the Milwaukee Society's article. And also in there you have like way information. If you really wanna do that, you can, but that would be a lot of, a lot of effort in my opinion. This is just another, even a different version I did of Ted Pamperin's waybills. These are ones I use, I model 1995. So these are ones I use for my modern sessions. A lot of the information, the previous one I removed and I just added, you say the top is the same, the railroad again. Then below, the next is the shipper. And previously we had other information for the modern ones I have, I added the logo of the shipper. I just think for like modern times, this adds like a neat, a neat you know, twist or something different to this. But obviously you can modify waybills however you want. This for me, for my modern operating sessions, I like to include the, the logo of the shippers. And one question people always ask me is, what if you can't find the logo? And if I can't find a logo, I just make up one in Photoshop. But 99.9% .9 of industries I found, you can easily find a logo on the internet. But some I have had to create like myself in Photoshop. But so the bottom is still the car's commodity. Say this is a plastic pellet covered hopper. So it's in plastic service. And the top again is the direction the car travels. That's the car's destination. And that's just the logo again of who is receiving the car. And this is, this is the, the car routing. And that the previous page, this had this more like advanced you know, information, but this one I moved the actual car routing down to here. And having that block allows you to have pretty much however long a car routing you actually want. Say so this car is in, it's in plastic service, so I have it going from a sit yard to going to the Corsicana to the Amico foam. They just industry had, they took plastic pellet cars and since it was the Amico industry, all the ones I've ever seen going there were Amico specific plastic pellet covered hoppers. But say these, the digitized label formats, you can easily modify each block to show whatever information you want. This slide is showing how you can mix and match the various formats. So this one on the left is the MicroMark car card then it has the modified like Ted Pamper and Waybills. Then the right side is the micro, the MicroMark one. Then it has the old line graphics, you know, Waybills. 
So you can mix and match whatever formats you want. I've seen quite a few layouts allow so the MicroMark car cards, then use this other people's Weibo formats. That's the one thing is if you're digitizing them, just make sure you actually fit them first, make sure it actually fits in there and doesn't cut off some information. Like on the left side, it does cut off some information, but the relevant information you can see without pulling it out of there. These are another one. This is from a previous OPSEG group. I just saved on here. I think this is, he presented this in maybe 2021. This is just a different type of car cards and waybills. I like this is, I think, one of the better ones I've seen. Also, like down the bottom, he put you no know, logos. I mean, there's some layouts that actually print out the row logos in the bottom or what, like what you in the bottom. That just provides us a different way. And this is though, a car card label format that I think he created himself. I'm not 100% sure, but like I just remember watching this, you know, OPSIG presentation. I thought his uh, car card label formats are very good. As you can see, the way bills are numbered by the railroad and the car type, which is a different way than some. And the right side, you can see the VIA is only used for cars which are picked up. In the top, you can see is this is well Western Pacific, then the car number, and no XM for boxcar, then the type of boxcar, then the color of the boxcar. Okay, these are more this if you want to do like prototype based waybills. These is obviously there's tons upon tons of these examples. Let's say Tony Thompson's box series, he has you no know, dozens upon dozens of prototype ones. I just put two here. This is a Baltimore and Ohio freight bill. And the right side is a CB and Q way bill. That one's also different because it's used by Railway Express. These are just examples of you know, prototype way bills. Each railroad did them slightly differently. Just, this is just slightly morphing towards if you want to do like more prototype based way bills. They said you could find these on eBay or train shows. This may be one of morph boards into using you know, exactly what the prototype railroads used. So these are the some of the Tony Thompson ones. The, this is the, towards the end of the presentation, so it's the, the most advanced ones. The car cards and waybills that Tony Thompson uses are, I'd say, the most advanced and best I've ever seen. Eventually, I'm going to have to you know, transfer all of mine over to this format. So if you want to know more about these, just go to his blog, blog series. The one key thing of these is the size. He sized them to 2.5 inch by 3.5 inch. And he did that so they could fit in baseball card collector sleeves. So he has all of his, you know, all of his you know, way bills in, you know, like those clear sleeves so you can carry it around easier. All this, I won't go too immense of these because you could look at Tony's blog. You know, how he explains them all, but this is based off of the prototype waybills that he you know, put down into the one that's more usable for modeling purposes. This sort of briefly, let's go from the top, then the down. This is at the very top, you have the railroad handling the car, then the to and the from, then the Cassini, then the shipper. He has the AAR class and then the route the routing information by the railroads and what towns they're in. And then the bottom, it's just the description of the articles, the type of commodity, then the boxcar. So it's SP boxcar 30366, then the AR designation. And the right side is a newer, a newer version of his. If you start in his blog series at number one and then go to whatever 100 it is now, he's actually changed his waybills over time to make the, this to make them slightly different. So you can see the various you know, evolution of what the way bills he used. Let's say, I think these are the, the best and most advanced ones I've seen. And eventually I'll have to convert all of mine to these, but that'll probably be like a six month period to actually transfer everything to this format. And this is just further going on. You can also have way bills for specific types of commodities and specific types of movements. I'd include all of them on here, but I just include two. So the left is just an empty car waybill, which he created. It goes, you can see it 
for the bottom, it's on a gondola, a Wabash gondola. And the bottom, it has the 52-6 gondola, and then the ARDX A is the GD. And it's just a simple routing for the empty car ones. And in the series, he showed this is based off of the prototype-based ones. And the right side, the pink one is a way built specifically for perishable traffic. Some traffic had specific waybills themselves. And this is an example he made from prototype ones. So this is a you know, SP perishable waybill. There's a you know, PFE car 74492. It's similar to one in the, the previous page, this, but this one is more specific for perishable traffic. So if you want to do more, oh, more advanced waybills, you could have specific waybills for specific types of commodities or specific movements. Another one for you to use is like a bad order way bill, but this in his blog series, he goes over all the various types of specific way bills for specific you no know, movements and car types. So this, this is just however, however advanced you want to go into your car cards and way bills. You know, most people probably don't want to do this much, but if you do, you know, this adds like a neat twist or a more prototype based twist to this. As I said at the very beginning, you know, some people have all their information on the waybills and they do not use car cards at all. So this is an example that Tony Thompson did for Otis McGee. And this is where all the information is on the waybill. So there's no car cards used at all. So it's here for your train, you're just given all the waybills. Now doing this makes it slightly larger in size, but you, know, you can scale it down to however you want. This is just one good example of how now you don't you don't even need car cards if you don't want to. You can set everything on the waybills. This is this one of one that he did. This right coming towards the end of the presentation, but as one thing people forget about is storage of these. The left is the one that the size that Tony Thompson used. One reason he said he did that is because you can readily find you know, baseball card storage boxes, you know, baseball card sleeves to put them in. And here you can see you organize it by, you can order it by however you want, by car type, by industry type. But here you organize it, I think, by industry type. This is an easy way, easy way of storing these. Moving over to the middle, that's a storage box that I found that works for the micro mark or old line graphics car cards. It's easy, I organize it by type. So that's a gondolas, reefers, box cars. But those boxes I bought at the container store. It comes with like five dividers in the middle, but you could have four or five of those and put all of the car cards, the entire layout in those boxes. And it's a right of it is like a, a box for the, the old, the Alan McClellan label format ones. I think that was also bought at the container store. We say those waybills you can organize however you want, either by car type, by industry type, by specific industry. This is this, this way of showing just how to do storage for the car cars and waybills. I mean, how you do that is not hardly up to you, but if you have a lot of off, off layout cars or you have layouts you know, in storage, you'll probably need more ways of storing the car cars and waybills. You know, these are just a couple examples of you know, good ways of storing them. All right. This is this. That's pretty much all I have. So there are questions now. As I said at the beginning, I'm not the expert on this. So these are just some of the formats I've seen used as ways up to seeing them stored. All right. Uh, let me bring up the chat window here. Um, let's see. This is a mess or question from Thomas, sort of to the group. What does everyone consider to be necessary at each station to be able to work car cards and way bills? Do operators use a box for each industry or just a box for the entire station? Um, I'll throw out, at least on um, some of the places I've been, there's a, a set out, a hold, and a pickup box. And if there's multiple industries, then maybe there's a divider. That's one way to do it. Uh, Cal is saying a box for each track. That works. Um, let me flip the security on here. Uh, if you have something to present, feel or something to contribute, feel free to 
uh, unmute yourself and chime in. Uh, Rick Watson uses a box for each industry, oops, or even each spot. Uh, Burr is using a box for each track, even if it has several industries. Uh, Ken is saying, I find a strip of J channel very handy at each station for sorting cards while working on them. Yeah, that's especially <laughs> helpful if you've got people who get uh, one of the first issues I edited of the OPSEC journal. We had a picture where there was a car card sitting on the scenery next to the car. And I got angry emails about that. It, it boggled my mind, but uh, the J channel will help with that. Um, all right, just kind of working back up through here. Anybody else have anything to contribute on the question about boxes at a station that Thomas asked? I use the boxes by track and then I use uh, binder combs, those plastic uh, ring thingies that yeah. uh, hold uh, uh, pamphlets together uh, to hold the car cards for sorting. Yep. Uh, Mark is saying one for each town, unless it has a big industry, then, um, yeah, if you've got like a large steel mill or something with a dozen or a, a dozen tracks or something, then one box probably going to do it. Um, uh, Dale says a box for each receiver location. Some receivers have multiple boxes. This depends on the spots to receive cars. All right. This is Carl Bloom. I, I use uh, three boxes and uh, they're for the next destinations. So like, you know, the other two towns and then the third box is just everything else. So that way you can pick up cars that are gonna get switched at your next stop. Okay. So you have more uh, switching action. You, are, is it like set out, hold and pick up? Nope, nope, definitely okay. not. Definitely not. It, when you you spot the car when it arrives, and then you turn the waybill. And as soon as you turn the waybill, you put it in the pocket for the next town. Okay. Bob Laxon here. We also use an off spot when there's too many yeah. cars on a track. The next guy in is supposed to do the off spot off spots first before anything is in the incoming consist. Yeah, and just for for everybody's benefit, I, and again, I don't know who's who all's here, so. Um, just terminology, um, when a car is placed at an industry track location, that term is typically spot. You spot the car there. So if you're at door one on track two, that car is spotted. However, if for some reason that spot is full, then you have to put that car somewhere else and that is considered an off spot. Uh, that's, a, that's a common term, but again, I don't know the audience here, so you may not have heard that before. So, basically, what you the two different methods are are one is that you do by where the car is in the process. That's the uh, spot hold uh, uh, um, off spot type box, and then the other one is you do it by its actual location, and that's the by track or by industry. Yeah. The prototype keeps track of the cars by track. Got it. All right. Uh, and let's see. Uh, Thomas also asked about color coding. Um, if you guys can see my screen here, this was from uh, Bruce Chubb's uh, Sunset Valley Railroad, um, which is an amazing layout up in. I, I don't know if it's still up. I know they were talking about putting it in a museum, you know, moving it to a museum, but I did get the chance to operate. You're asking specifically about color coding Thomas, and he's doing that. Now his layout is incredibly complex and the color coding helps you figure out, okay, which branch is it going to? But you know, his cars are incredibly simple. It's like, there's the, there's the code, I'm, I'm assuming that, the TP is the, the tanker. Yeah, that's the that's your XM code. There's your number, but then there's a picture of the car. <laughs> so there's no question as to which car this is, but then his waybill is incredibly simple. Um, all of the prototype information that uh, we're seeing on those sample ones, he's kind of skipped that for just, 
okay, where is this car going? What's it got in it? Where did it come from? Because that's what, you know, the, the other stuff is great for that simulation, but from a practical standpoint, this is where, this is where I need to move this car to. So, but that kind of, the, the color codes obviously helps you figure out or help the, the main yard figure out, okay, which branch does this need to go on? So. Uh, let's see. What does everyone prefer to use, keep, use to keep car cards together? Um, I'll throw out a big binder clip will work. Um, that's one option. Um, stick them in your stick them in your apron or your pocket. But before you do that, make sure you have people check their pockets before they leave. <laughs> Car cards tend to tend to walk otherwise. Uh, I use I use train books. So oh, that's clever. The front front has a pocket, one of those stick-on business card pockets. You put the locomotive yeah. card in there, and then it's also handy because, like here, I, I have down the secret code for changing sound. Oh, nice! And then when you open it up, there's uh, let's see, Vern Summit, first town it's going to, and then. Can you there's pull three one pockets those, here. Can you pull one of those cards out so we can? Switch? Yeah, yeah. So here's the actual actual way bill. There it is. Uh, there you, uh, the back top. it up. Back it up just a little bit. Okay. Let's, let's see if I can get the glare right. There we go. There okay. We go. So so the top's got the uh, car number really nice and large, and then the railroad name, and then yep. the bottom. Let's see what's have. It's it's got the car type. And it's it's actual color. Good idea. And then and your way bill. Below, is, yeah, it's an interesting way bill. The four four cycle, and you just kind of turn it or turn it clockwise. Eight cycle. Eight cycle. Whoa! Wow! Look at that. So you turn it. Let's see. Is it on two? So when you get to four. You just flip oh, it over, right. and you go to five. Which, yeah. uh, we like these because it, it keeps the car out there so long it it doesn't seem repetitive that it goes to the same place each each sequence sequence yeah um, these are like the baseball card holders but I make these out of those uh, pockets for uh, three ring binders yeah. I have one of those heat sealers so I can change the size of oh them. yeah yeah those are great uh, so then you know in the book, you know, the back side of that page is the next town, next two towns. And when you get to the end of the book, anything you haven't switched just goes back to the yard. That's a great idea. I like that. Now, if you've got a 40 car train, that book is, you're running smaller trains than. Yes. Yeah. But uh, still, I'm an O gauge and the yeah. uh, six car train is pretty big. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. But, but then, uh, you know, if you go to Roof Mountain, a lot of times you switch all, all six cars and it'll take you a half an hour or so to do all that. That's great. Thanks for sharing. Sure. Yeah, Bruce, go ahead. So we we use uh, the old, old line graphics style cards and waybills. And we have like a just a plastic envelope that they all fit in that also includes the engine brief. So it's kind of like Carl's book, but it's in a plastic envelope, so it's all kept together. Um, like a uh, the. Uh, let me bring one up here. Uh, let's see. Like this sort of. Uh, oops. Like this sort of card. Well, that's. Yeah, that's the um, that's, an engine that's the en that's the engine card. Okay. Uh, but there's also a train brief. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll get off for a minute and see if I can find one. This was an this was one from uh, Ted Schnepp's massive O gauge layout. Um, yeah. He has a 
a card, an engine card that has all of the sound features, as well as this is the back of it, where it has some of the special instructions. So not quite a car card way bill, but uh, it's uh, so, still helpful. So we have one of those for the consist or the locomotive. We also have another instruction that tells the end, the crew what the train does. If it goes from yeah, station yeah, A yeah. to station D, if it goes from station A to station B and does switching and then comes back, yeah, um, it I tells how many cars the maximum is for that train. We don't run any trains more than 24 cars long without dispatcher's approval. But the car card, the consist, and all the, I'm sorry, the train instructions, the locomotive instructions, and all the car cards fit in a plastic sleeve that's big enough to hold them all. So instead of the binder clip that you were talking about, they're all in an envelope. Yeah, so if you guys can see that, that green card, again, this is from Bruce's layout. There's your, I think that's similar to what you're talking about, Bruce. That's what exactly. I call a train brief. Yep, yep. Behind that, you see an engine consist. Yep. That's your the locomotive card. instructions. Yep. And behind that are all the car cards. Yep. We take all those and put them into a, a see-through envelope that holds the whole thing. Yeah. And like the one here, it's a little bit blurry, but it's basically saying, okay, here's the instructions, but you need your timetable as well. So, but yeah, like I said, make sure you get, uh, uh, get everybody to dump their pockets before they leave. So uh, somebody was asking about um, if you're using switch lists as in JMRI, yeah, then a lot of people using JMRI are not using car cards at all. Um, they, they've uh, they've gone and done away with them. Um, I haven't seen a personal, and again, N equals one here. I haven't seen a layout where they're using both the JMRI switch list and still maintaining car cards. Uh, but that's just my personal experience. So can't have your cake and eat it too. Do it. Can't have your cake and eat it too. No, no. I mean, it's the thing is when JMRI is managing where all the cars are, you don't, the card seem, at least the specific car cards. So I can see the engine cards still being helpful with like, here's how you dial up the sound and, and so on. And then the train instructions and so on. But I think a lot of that you can, I think JMRI will print a lot of that onto the sheets. I, so I, I wind up, uh, uh, I've developed sort of an Excel spreadsheet to manage my switch lists. Uh, and um, the start of the process is the car uh, way bills and car cards. Um, I have the uh, way bills inside car cards sitting on uh, based on what track the cars are on. And uh, as you put together a train, um, the uh, car cards and way bills go into a departure track box. And uh, then uh, when it's all ready to go, the engineer picks up or the conductor picks up the uh, car card for the engine and the caboose, clips them all together and, and puts them in with the, uh, the switch list board. So I, I, in part, I'm trying to sort of simulate the conductor taking his manifests on board the caboose. Yeah. Yep. I uh, have seen uh, I have seen some people use a like Excel utility. They'll take the JMRI switch list output and turn it into a set of one shot uh, car cards just because their local crews <laughs> like to handle that rather than a sheet of paper. Yeah, I did. Um... Again, I'm not actively operating quite yet, but uh, you were talking about the train instructions. Um, this is designed to print out onto some Avery cardstock. 
which then I'll laminate eventually. Um, but say, okay, here are the instruction cards. You're talking about the um, the Excel sheet, and this is using. Um, there's a number of people using it. Uh, it's nothing, nothing I developed, but it's the um, the car order system where you're talking about types of cars instead. Um, let me share this. So like here, instead of saying XM or LO, it's like covered hopper 50 to 60 foot, because there's some that are 50, it's 54, 55. And so I can basically use this, it will print, and I cut it using my wife's little thing she used for scrapbooking. Um, and then these get stuffed in, they print double-sided, and then they get stuffed into the little, uh, little plastic envelopes. Um, but yeah, it was uh, something I think uh, either Dan Heinel gave me or he gave it, whoever did the original one had this available. So it prints out real nicely. See mine there, Eric? Yeah, yeah, exactly that. It's the same, uh, the, whatever, the, those little, uh, little plastic packets, I got them at, uh, I think I got them at Staples or somewhere. I don't remember where I got them, but. Um, somebody asking about intermodal. Um, we actually had this question come up a while ago. If people were switching and looking for specific containers, um, and my answer to him was, I had never been on a layout where they were saying, "Okay, you need to deliver container one, two, three, four, five, and pick up container two, three, four, five, six. I have never seen that in operations. Um, we've got a pretty good group here. If other people have, that's fine. But as far as dealing with the specific car, a five unit set of stacks is considered one car. Now there's an A, B, C, D, E, but at least in my experience, if there are car cards at all, you get one for the whole string. Or, you know, whether it's a set of splines, now, if you've got those Husky stacks that are the individual with couplers on either end, those get their own car or their own card. But a five pack of splines, that is one card. And in my case, I don't switch with those at this point. So I don't even have car cards for those. There's a, there's a train instruction sheet that says, okay, you're basically running the railroad. Don't run into, you know, your mainline freight, we don't switch you. You're just your bridge traffic. But like I said, if other people are doing stuff with containers, uh, I'd be love to hear what you're doing because we've had that question come up a couple times. Yeah, I, I could see that from a prototypical standpoint that you know you want to know where each container is. Um, if the uh, and the car is built from a ramp to another ramp mm -hmm. and the uh, containers are, are on it and it doesn't really matter where the containers are going if the car is built to chicago all the containers are going to chicago right. and um they will have different destinations on a car they're going in that general direction and they'd be unloaded and, and rubber tired and all sorts of other stuff at the other end, but that's where they're going. The BNSF treats, or at least one time, treated a, it is one car. The Union Pacific treated it as separate platforms, but they all had the same way bill. Interesting. Well, yeah, I guess that's the, that's the thing we, we have to remember is the fact that we're not going to be delivering these containers to the industry. <laughs> no, that's, that's the, you know, the only thing you would be doing potentially is, uh, yeah, as you said, they're not going to be swapping one container, putting on another one, or would they, if you pull in, pull a five pack into Chicago, into Chicago, are they going to keep, I would think that they would keep all of the containers going to the same place. Right. 
you're on mute. Well, the, the car would be unloaded and it might have to go back empty because they need it at the coast again. Oh yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying is like if you've got, let's say, a five five pack double double stack set, those 10 containers are probably all going to the same ramp, right? The same ramp, but not necessarily the same destination, especially okay. at a large place like Chicago. They could have a, a car, a container for the BNSF, a car, or excuse me, a con for the Norfolk Southern, the CSX, for the CN, the CP, all on the same five pack uh, car. Yeah. They'd run it into the ramp, unload it, rubber tire interchange it, and then reload it. Yeah, so I guess it is the same thing. It's just, it's interchanging to some point off the railroad, you know, as you yeah. said, rubber tired to, you know, down I-65 or something. So, but anyway. So yeah, you could definitely do it. I think uh, uh, Magnus, I think you were the one asking. I think the one problem you'd have is that the car, the container numbers are really, really, really tiny <laughs> on, a, on like an HO container. And an end gauge would be completely impossible. I think you could maybe do something where you say, okay, these are all um, uh, like JB Hunt containers or Schneider containers or heck, Amazon containers. And basically say, okay, you need to swap out the six Amazon containers here at the Chicago ramp. And you're going to pick up four uh, whatever. JB Hunt containers and put in. That might be one way to do it so you're not having to track down individual numbers. Because unless you're going to go through the process of doing individual numbers on all your containers, um, yeah, that could get in the house again. <laughs> that could get real interesting <laughs> and probably a little frustrating. Like everybody's got their readers out and their magnifying lenses on to try to read the container numbers. But I like I said, I'm not discouraging whatsoever. I think it's, I just have not seen it. <laughs> this is Doug Gurren. I have a, a general question about how do you minimize the amount of thinking and effort the um, owner or somebody else like a, a mole fiddler has to do during a session and between sessions to you know, reduce the setup time and stresses of, of that kind of thing. And especially, when you want the incoming train into the mall, for example, to be as easy to handle by the 050 guy in terms of what shelf or drawer or storage track things go to. I haven't heard much talked about minimizing the effort of handling the car cards. Sure. And uh, the uh, way bills. Yeah, just for, again, just for everybody's benefit, when uh, he's talking about a mole, what we're talking about is a a staging yard, probably maybe out of sight, where a mole operator is actually physically lifting the cars off the track. Sometimes people will have drawers to put these trains in where they can have more trains in the drawers than they have room for on the tracks. So that's what we talk when we're talking about a mole, that's that's what he's referring to. Is, is that a fair? description well, of that. The, I just wanted the, to describe the, it. For the variation that I would put on it is there's both active staging and what more commonly called passive staging where the owner and his friends might do it between yep. sessions. Yep. But I'm particularly interested in reducing the thinking burdens on the mole yeah. by designing a thoughtful car card that makes it relatively simpler and involve less time. My suggestion would be blocking because on the prototype railroad, a block code is what they use to route cars. That's what drives the whole thing is a four letter block code. And um, so if you had the train going into staging, if you had two or three blocks in the train, so all the cars going to, uh, that were gonna stay on the track, be in the Houston block and all the cars that were going to be on going to the that you're going to take off the, the and put into the the drawers in the Fort Worth block and then 
all the ones that you are going to move over to the next track in the San Antonio block, and it's a train to Texas, you would just drive it in there, and then you'd have all the cars organized by block in the train, and it would be easy for them to do. Yep. Um, but it requires the switching and the blocking to happen someplace out on the visible layout. Right. And that's the hard part. The challenge for me is that I won't have anywhere near enough classification tracks to do very much of a right. fine tuning, although I do plan on doing something that I haven't heard too many model railroaders do, which is asking the way freight crew to pre-block at least the hot cars or the priority cars before returning to their origin or destination yard in order to simplify the, you know, the overall, you know, handling of the, the car movements. Well, I guess the, the question is, in, in your case, when the train pulls into staging, does the entire train come off or are you switching it and sending it back out? Is it, it's like going to be a little bit, session? it's going to be a little bit of both. Some of the distinctive cars with, in my case, World War II, um, you know, open loads, they might got recycled after a while. And they're, the resin cars are delicate, so I don't want any more handling of those yeah. than possible, so on and so forth. So it's not, you know, just a, a straightforward thing. In, the, in addition, on my prototype railroad, the, the train cars of, say, empties or even westbounds all go to the nearest hump yard, which is off stage, And there it gets more finely classified easily using the gravity. So I have plans to have the equivalent of almost like a junk trains going to the to the hump yard and maybe some special cars that are delicate or have hazmats or something get pre-blocked, you know, for the transshipment as far as the, um, the hump I'm yard. I'm trying to remember it. We had, well, shoot. Um, somebody you might want to talk to and Dave Hussman, help me out here. Does uh, John Parker do, he does active staging on his, on his layout, doesn't he? I'm not sure. Um, I'm yeah, Parker to... does do active, but I've never worked that position. Okay. Um, John Parker has the uh, BNSF Fall River Division um, layout. And just for size and scope, I just put some photos up from, I shared some photos up. Um, his, there we go. you may want to have a quick chat with him because like this is one of his i don't know if you can see the picture there yes there's one of these yards on both sides of the room there's one kind of behind her as well and this is his his uh you know, let me see if there's another one here that's his staging and as far as i know and Dave is confirming that we believe he's doing active staging where he's pulling, I think he's pulling stuff on and off or at least re, resorting it. So you may want to reach out to him. Um, you can contact, if you go to bnsfrr.net, I'll drop that in the chat here. He may have some suggestions. There was another, uh, the bottom line is you want to you want to sort the cars and separate the cars. You either have to do it in the visible area or you have to do it in the hidden area. But someplace you're going to have to sort the cars. Yeah. So yeah, I'm, I don't know if I've got a good answer for you, other than as what Dave said, you, you got to sort them somewhere. You know when they come in. If you're, you know, they're coming into a yard, getting resort, you know, reorganized and blocked, and then going into staging. Okay, well then you know at least the first six cars, all right, they're going off, off layout. They go into a drawer. The next batch, okay, these are making up the next local that are, is leaving. So that would probably speed things up. But I, again, I don't, I don't have a good example. There's another. Actually, there was one other, I was trying to find it. Let's see if we... Well, I think that Lee Nicholas basically 
takes everything off when it goes to staging and in essence removes the waybill. He's not using waybills, but in essence, that would be what he's looking at. And then he makes up a, a train list as to what kind of car he needs, pulls it off the staging or the shelf or the drawer and assigns a waybill to that car and then puts it into the train. That's, you said that's Lee Nicholas? Yes. Um, he's got the Utah Colorado Western. We have a video from him out in the OPSIG YouTube channel, um, December 6, 2020, um, where he talks about the operation software. Uh, let me bring up a link for that for you. If you look at the chat or just go to the YouTube channel for OPSIG. Um, here we go. Oh, he's actually got a link here for his website too. Oop. Another option might be to have uh, a kind of a general uh, staging yard group or block and then have a, for lack of a better term, special and you drive all of your cars that you're going to want to, uh, that wants to need special handling into that, that special block. And back in the staging yard, you have a switch engine and you have the ability for the yard engine to actually physically switch out the cars that you don't want them touching. And they stay on the layout and everything else, then they would be, could physically handle those, but you make a, just a, any old car block for staging, and then you make a cars you want to have special handling for block in the staging. Yeah. So those, you say some resin cars that are, are too fragile to be, to be moved. Um, all right. Well, I dropped a link and it looks like Lee's website is dead now, but the, the first YouTube link there is his presentation he gave for the virtual meetup a couple of years ago. Um, there's also, it looks like he's got the uh, Model Railroad Academy thing. Um, you might be able to get something out of that, but you got to pay for that. So, Isn't his railroad sort of a sophisticated railroad where he has scanners that identify the cars and he has that special waybill system that I don't think has quite yet been explained by him or Henry Freeman. Um, um, that video actually stuff. that video actually goes into that that system he has, but I don't think he's got RFID. I think that's Seth Newman. No, I, I was out there. He didn't have RFID. Okay. Seth Newman's company sells the stuff to do RFID, but I don't remember which layout is using it. So yeah. It's pretty expensive. It's like a dollar and a half a car yeah. for, the, for the tags. Hey, the uh, other thing. To, oh, I'm uh, sorry. Back to Gail's original question, you know, how do you minimize setup for each session? Yeah. Uh, what we do is is the, the programs, the schedule is never ending. When you get to the end, it's just the start of the next one. So uh, here's here's our schedule board. So the, uh, the horizontal lines are each town. And then the, the pins you see at the top, those, those are the trains. And it's, it's hard to see here, but let's see. The trains down here that are ending just are, continue up here. So you know we can stop an operating session anytime you want and just pick it, pick it up where, where we, the next session starts. I think part of that, it, depending on the type of railroad you're running, like my staging is is butt ended, so when the train comes in, I got to turn it. Now I've got, you know, when I get my railroad up and running, I have 16 staging tracks, eight for the west, eight for the east, and unfortunately, I didn't have the ability to put in a reverse loop, so that when the train does come in, you could basically turn it and it's ready to go for the next session. So there will be a point where Either I play nice and I back the train out, move the engine and do it like that, or I just 050 the thing. Um, 
So, I mean, that's one of those things that, you know, and then as far as what Carl said, the idea of continuous staging, right? There's always that point where you've got to reconcile are the car cards and the cars where they're supposed to be, right? No matter where you go. Now I'm using this system, it came out of Michigan, a couple other places called car orders where I'm looking for car types, but I still have to go through and make sure that, okay, this is supposed to have a car in these three spots. It is, okay, great. But yeah, mine will basically be, you know, if we don't get all the way done or when we do run all the trains, we just go to the next session and we just keep going. You know, it's, that's one of the, the nice things about it. Um, you know, that continuous, you know, if I want to go down and run a train, well, I have a list. It's like, okay, here's what I want to run. And I can just keep track. Oh, okay. Well, I did this one. I did another one, but then we'll just pick up where we left off. So yeah, having that staging and obviously the active staging is a different situation, but the, to be able to be, to be able to turn the railroad, especially if you're hosting an event and you want to have a session in the morning and a session in the afternoon, you got to be able to turn the railroad quick, right? You've got two hours between sessions. And if you've got, you know, as what Carl was describing, if you hit continuous run, that works great. You know, if you can turn those trains, I mean, even if you're 05 owing it, you can move it. Even if you're not, you can move engines for 16 trains in two hours. That's not that, it's not that hard. So. Well, with my system, it's like, you know, every, every eight train hours, the yard has to make up a train doesn't have to have all those trains made up at the beginning so you know yeah every yeah. every eight hours the train comes in and then you need another train made up to go out again right right yep and i use the you know the the yards are making up the locals based on the cars coming in off of the manifests that stop by when they've got cars to go then they can run a local out you know there's a cap on how many cars so there's always something, you know, something going. Um, I, I don't know if that helps you or not. Maybe some of those people I pointed you to would, uh, um, it says Gail in your your thing, but I don't think that was it, what you said your name. It's her laptop, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. Mr. Gail. <laughs> Shifting gears is another topic I wonder about is how, how sophisticated have people been able to do, get with their operating systems? Let me give you an example. Um, real railroads care a lot about the timing of the moves at the origin or especially at the destination. So for example, LCL, you might expect would want early spotting to have the most time, the earliest availability to the receivers. And that might be true also for freight forwarders and livestock and a few other kinds of things that you know, are time related. In other cases, there might be a whole string of protected service. In other words, the produce yard team tracks have to be all spotted by 6 a.m. Um, some of these are car related, some of them are destination related. That's one. That's just one example of sophistication and how it might relate or not to the car card way bill setup. And I'm just wondering what people have found are the limits that they've been able to ask of their their operators, either, you know, the not the beginners, but even the more experienced ones. Yeah. As I've heard, don't expect very much even from experienced ones yeah. besides getting the car in the right spot. May, let me throw out a quick example and we'll open it up. Uh, Joe Berger up in Northeast Indiana models the, I think it's a great Northern uh, railroad. And his, his, there's a number of places where he's dealing with produce you know, apples and so on. And what he does during his sessions, at least he did the last time I went, is he will say, okay, this date, today's date is blank 1950, whatever. The temperature outside is this. And if it's too warm, well, then your train has to stop and ice. Now, if it's cold enough, well, you don't have to because the apples aren't going to spoil. So that's just one little thing he does on his, that's a, you know, it, it just adds to the simulation. Is that the sort of thing you're looking for? Um, 
Yeah, the example that comes to my mind, there's an excellent layout owned by John King, and he models the Apple industry in the Shenandoah Valley. And he had me running a refrigerator car train to the town that had all the warehouses. And he told me that some of the cars are hot cars and some of them have been iced already. So mm -hmm. the question came to me of, well, what order do you spot them in? And, you know, where are the instructions that would guide people that would say, you know, what you do in a case like that? That's just an example where you have special handling and time and so on. It's a good question. Um, what, what, what is the group? Any, any ideas from the group? I, I, I see that as not as a, a car card problem, but as a train card problem and giving them, giving them clear instructions. So you have to, he should have said, you have cars that are iced, pre-iced and you have cars that are not pre-iced and you, have, you should spot the pre-iced cars before the, the other uh, cars yeah. or something like that. That, that is something that, that yeah. should be in the train car telling you what you need to do. Right, it, but yeah, we haven't-, Bruce, we was haven't calling the, Bruce was calling on the train brief saying- We haven't- Excuse me, we haven't talked about showing that information though on the way bill um, in terms of the status of the, the, the car in that case. We've talked, of course, about whether cars need to be iced. So that that's just something I mean, where you could stick a like, a, I think, Dave, you were talking about having a different color. You could put in, you know, if you've got a traditional car card way bill or envelope, you could stick in like a little extra card saying this car is iced or this one is not, that might be some, and the ice is only good until, you know, eight hours on a clock or 24 hours or something. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Well, you know, the Great Northern had a, a train procedures book and I just wanna put in a plug for those because it does what, come back to what information you provide on car cards and way bills. But interestingly enough, it was shipping a lot of reefers eastbound with, you know, perishables like apples and peaches. But the instruction was do not put this refrigerator car in that train because it's routed in a way that doesn't have any re-icing capabilities. Mm. So there you have subtleties about the status of the load yeah. and the routings and so on. And that's just an example of sophistication. I'm just not sure what yard masters or train crews and so on might even be, um, you know, skilled or interested in you know, handling things like that. The problem, the problem is how much information can the crew absorb and be effective. And if you put too much information, the, the crew's eyes will glaze over and they won't, they won't remember enough of it to be effective. This is where I uh, find sort of putting things together uh, by myself instead of using uh, a regular computer program or whatnot, um, I wind up that uh, as a dispatcher, I, I pretend in between sessions, I'm dispatcher and freight agent. And, uh, you know, as dispatcher, oh, I've got a stock car. This needs to get to the next place quickly. I've got something that's perish with perishable foods. I need to move that ahead of something else. So I might have had some cars that I'd like to put on the next train but I've got to bump them for, for cars that have to move quickly. So I do that as a dispatcher freight agent, rather than have the operators try to figure that out during an operating session. So what they have is basically, here's the cars that you have to put together in this order. And um, uh, you know if I figure out that uh, some cars need to go to uh, rep get repaired or weighed or whatnot, or need to go to icing, all of those things are built into the switch list early on so that basically the, uh, the engineer running the, uh, uh, the, uh, the switcher and the flagman don't have to sort of figure out a whole lot of things. They're just sort of, I've got to move this car to get icing. And then later on, I move it out from icing to put it on the next train going out. Yeah, you could, you could just add on the way bills, one of the stops is the uh, ice tower. 
Yeah, there was, um, I don't remember who it was. There was somebody who was modeling the citrus industry. Um, it Was it, I don't remember if we covered it here, but it was a very complicated um, process that it's sounding kind of like what you're looking for. It might have been Rick Watson, um, but it was about, it was like Southern California and there were all these different steps for a reefer car to go through other than just spot it and pick it up. There were all these other steps that had to go through. I can't, I can't remember where, where that was. Well, it's, it's been covered a little bit and the, the process might vary with the commodity being shipped because a, a soft product you know, might be more sensitive to things than others. And so I think the sequence was just something like um, you pre-ice the car that might be sitting in the hot sun so it's cool when it's delivered. And then you put the, car, the load in the refrigerator car and the heat from the uncooled commodity warms it up right away. And yeah. so you might need to add a third level of ice before you ship it out because of the yeah. uh, the interim delays. And, and that can be indicated, you know, in, maybe in a small number of cases. Right. Um, I agree with the person who said you can't overwhelm, you know, the operators. That's why I was asking for the limits of, you know, what have some people, especially people with leadership skills, been able to, uh, you know, pass along? Um, one of the other examples that had come to mind was, how do you identify what your railroad's signature traffic is? That is, it tells the yard masters or the local crews, you know, these are the kinds of cars we want to give the best service to and other cars of the same type or whatever um, don't require that attention. What, what the, a friend of mine is doing in Southern California. And so he does, has to do icing and weighing and all that other stuff. Uh, perishables and what we kind of settled on is some little additional slips that fit in front of the waybill in the car card pocket and so it will say ice this car and the before the session the clerk will go around and put those in those particular cars so the crew doing it all they do is they see ice this car now they don't know whether it's pre-iced or post-iced or what the thing is. All they know is they put it on the ice dock because that's all they need to know. And then they just follow that. And when they put that in there, you can tell them after you spot the car, you can pull that card. And you could actually have two or three layers of those cars in there that the person setting up the session loads in there and then the crew pulls the card out when they accomplish it and then it could tell them what to do next because that's that would mimic kind of what is actually going to happen because the switch crew isn't going to make that decision the clerks or the yard master is what uh, matt thompson does at his uh, swift plant is takes the uh, the reefers puts them to the ice dock and he actually has a timer that when the car is set at the ice dock, you push the button and uh, 20 minutes later, the bell rings and it's time then to move that car to be loaded at the, uh, uh, at the slaughterhouse and so on or re, uh, re-iced if needed. Did you say that Matt Thompson? Yeah. Yeah, his was, uh, we did, we covered his in September. Um, I threw a throwing a link out there, the Oregon Oregon Coast Railroad. I think yep. he talk, that may be what I'm thinking of is the the process for the cars. But he's he's a good guy. You'd probably be able to reach out to him and ask him too. So all right. Uh, Eric. Sir. Uh, if you want to see something different on holding tracks. Sure, go ahead. Okay, I just, I've had these for a long time. Uh, I just did an upgrade. Uh, you can see seven of the tracks up there on the wall. And then down here, this is, this is the new control panel for it. Okay. So I can, let's see. Uh, 
I'll go. So I can push five. And it will. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> stepping. Uh, I got a stepping motor installed now. So it goes directly to track five, slows down, and, and stops at track five. Oh, that's awesome. Or go all down, rest the way down to one. So the, the first tracks are the imaginary off, off layout towns. Yeah. Are there in schedule. Oh, that's slick. And then let's see, I think, uh, yeah, there's, I got the, the Burlington Zephyr on track two. And that's, that's my passenger train. Yep. Like yep. about every 12 hours, it, it goes to a different holding track. Right. So it, it runs the whole layout and comes back and goes on a different track, which, you know, disrupts everybody else. Oh, yeah. At the yeah. various towns. That's the best part about it. I've, I've got some passenger trains I'm going to run, and they're just there to disrupt things, you uh -huh. know, just to, hey, get out of the way. You know, we actually prioritize passenger traffic on our railroad. That's very so cool. Got, got nine tracks. How long are those tracks? It's uh, they're 10 foot. 10 feet. Okay. And the other upgrade I did was uh, the lifting mechanism has bicycle chains. It's a little more more stable than aircraft cables. Oh, cool. Yeah, I think I'd want to put some plexiglass on the front of that or something. That just, ooh, that just makes me nervous. <laughs> well, this... the uh, the tracks that don't line up with the layout don't have power. Oh. Do so it now. Sorry. The, the tracks that aren't lined up with the layout don't have power. Oh, no, no, no. I'm more worried about things tipping out. <laughs> uh, I, I've only had to do that on purpose. Okay. <laughs> that is cool. Vertical staging. That, that's slick. But All right. Well, did we uh, appreciate everybody showing up? Uh, we had over 90 people. I think we had 91 today, so that's great. Um, but I appreciate everybody sticking around for, for overtime. Um, our next event will be uh, January 15th. Um, and we'll have publicity out prior to that. Uh, wish everybody Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, whatever you celebrate or don't celebrate. Get, get some train playing in. <laughs> of course, most, a lot of you are retired, so you, that's all you do. But I have to go to work, so... Too Thanks bad. for coming, and uh, we'll see you in the new year. All right. Merry Christmas. Bye, everyone. Bye. Merry Christmas.